Hello, Lancers. In this video, we're going to introduce circuits. I'm going to define some important terms that we will use as we talk about circuits. I'm going to talk about what happens to circuits uh, that are open and closed. We're going to talk about the schematics and series and parallel. And we're going to save the analysis of circuits for another video. Okay? So this is more of an introduction. Um, the first term we're going to define is the volt. Okay? Or voltage. The voltage. The SI unit for voltage is the volt, which makes it nice and easy. And it is, the definition is the amount of energy each charge is carrying. So the amount of energy per charge is your volt. The second term we need to define is current. The SI unit for current is the ampere, or amp, and is defined as the rate that the charges are flowing through your circuit. It's literally like if you were to look at one spot in the wire, how many electrons go by each second? That's your current, okay? The third thing we need to define is resistance. That's how much the wire is slowing down the flow of charges in the circuit. Um, or it doesn't have to be a wire, but whatever is in the circuit trying to stop the electrons from moving or resisting their flow, we call that resistance. Okay? The SI unit for resistance is the ohm, named after George Ohm, who did some um, work with the, the uh, relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. By way of analogy, we're going to view this up here as a boat that has an off-ramp and an on-ramp. Sailors can get off the off-ramp and they have to stay on the boardwalk. So these sailors must walk on the boardwalk and then they have a couple shops they can go through, a hot dog shop or the pathway split. They can go through the cotton candy store or the ice cream store and they come back to the on-ramp to get back on the boat. Now, if we were to compare this to a circuit, we could say the number of sailors getting off the boat each second was your current. So we'll do the sailors in orange here. So if you have a sailor here, 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 how fast these sailors are walking by that point would be the current in that point. How much money they had to spend in each of these shops would determine the voltage, just like how much power they're going to exert, how much energy they're going to dissipate as they go through. That's kind of like the voltage they have. Sometimes they have to go through just one thing, like they all have to stop at the hot dog shop, but then they have a choice. There's a split in the road, the boardwalk goes two ways. They can either get cotton candy or ice cream before returning to the boat. And so the rate that the soldiers walk would be like your um, current, the amount of money they have to spend would be like your voltage, and these hot dog, ice cream, and candy cotton candy place to slow them down, so that's kind of like the resistance in that path walking through the circuit. It's an analogy. Here's another analogy. I have a piece of wood here that has a bunch of screws screwed into it, partially. They stick out quite a bit, and what I'm going to do is roll a marble down through the screws. So I'm going to release the marble at the top. And let it get down. And so it go all the way down. Now, there's quite a bit of analogy between a marble rolling through here and electricity. If you can imagine this being a little section of wire, these screws could represent the resistance in the wire. More screws is a bigger resistance, and I am with high resistivity, making it harder for the Marble will roll through. Group two, you may go to the cafeteria for lunch at this time. Please make sure to social distance and pull your mask up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other thing we could do is tilt this. Tilting this would give the marble more potential energy when it started at a higher angle here. And that would re re be sort of analogous to a higher voltage. So when you have more energy, you have more voltage, these things are going to go through with more energy and dissipate more energy as they hit. What would the number of marbles I release represent? So if I rolled down instead of one marble, let's say five, that would be analogous to me having five times the current. So the number of charges that go by each second is the current. Another thing I like about this analogy is as the current goes through and hits 
some of these, what I would call the nucleus of the atoms, okay, the, these posts, these screws, you hear a little bit of sound, it slows it down. That's releasing some of the energy, the potential energy is headed to the top. Very similarly, in a circuit, as the electron flows through and hits some of the atoms in the circuit, some of the nuclei, then that causes the nuclei to shake a little bit. Now here that shaking comes out as sound, but in the, the, the wire that's going to come out is heat. Little vibrations will be heat. So when you run electricity through something with high resistance, it will actually get hot and convert that um, electrical energy to thermal energy. Because resistors get hot or heat up as you put electricity through them, that can be useful. And you can see this is a stovetop element that you can plug in and heat things up with. What is this? This is just a special type of resistor designed to convert the electrical energy from the charges into heat that we can then use to heat up water and cook our potatoes. So sometimes we're using resistors just for the purpose of making heat, although that's not the most common, perhaps, use of resistors. Resistors like these, these are resistors that we can often find in a circuit. Um, these particular ones are great because they can reduce the voltage or uh, push more current through one branch of a circuit or another. And you find these commonly being used in circuits. And they have some colored stripes on here that tell you the amount of resistance. Um, I don't want to get into how we use the color codes in this video, but you can look that up or maybe I'll make another video on that. But they have a set amount of resistance. At this time, group three, please report to the cafeteria. Please remember to social distance and pull your mask up and enjoy your lunch. The colors just tell you the amount of resistance of the particular resistor. Okay, so keep that in mind. They are sometimes different physically in size, and what you'll notice is that the bigger size is physically means the more power they can handle. Because they do heat up, when you put more power through them, the harder they're going to get, and you can actually make them so hot that they catch on fire and flame up. And so they have a limit based on how much power you can put through them that's still safe and it's not going to catch on fire. And that limit is based on how much heat they can dissipate, which is based on their physical size. So physically, when you see a bigger resistor, it doesn't mean it has more resistance. It means it can handle more power before it catches on fire. This is a good thing to know. Okay. At this time, group four, you may go to the cafeteria. Please remember to social distance and pull your mask up and enjoy your lunch. Thank you. So another big difference, or vocabulary we need to know, is the difference between AC and DC. So the current, the amps, can come in two varieties. Alternating current or direct current. Direct current means the electrons leave one terminal and go directly to the other terminal. It's a straight line path, that's all they do. However, with AC or alternating current, the electrons start at one terminal, go part of the way toward the other one, then stop and come back, stop and come back, stop and so they're going back and forth, back and forth. Now, the reason this works is because it's not just the electrons that terminal doing it, it's all the electrons in the entire wire. When you use AC, they don't even give you fresh electrons. They take the electrons that are already in the atom to make up those wires and just shake them back and forth. So as they go back and forth, back and forth, that's AC. This device is an oscilloscope. It's designed to show you in a, a graph what the voltage looks like. Right now, I have 1.8 volts DC going into it. And notice it is a horizontal line, meaning the voltage is staying at 1.8 volts the whole time. What's going to happen though, is I'm going to move this over, pull the wires out there and bring them over here to the AC, and notice with AC, the voltage line is going up and down. This is because the voltage is going up positive and down negative, positive negative, meaning when the voltage is positive, the electrons go in one direction, and when it's negative, it goes in another direction. And this changes very rapidly, okay? Our outlets in the United States have AC electricity in the direction of, uh, that the changes, the direction of flow of current changes 60 times every second. That's why we say we have 60 hertz of electricity in the US. Interestingly, Europe only uses 50 hertz. 
That's why some of your devices that work in the US, if you plug in in Europe, don't work. So you do need to be careful there. Keep in mind, because my head's a job. Keep in mind, batteries provide DC electricity. So your outlet gives AC, batteries give DC. So if you have something that can use both batteries or the outlet, like say a Chromebook, there's always a special kind of plug for it. The plug is stuck. Like this, where there's a little box in the plug. What's this box do? This box converts the AC from the outlet to DC that the Chromebook actually runs on. Because if it can run off batteries, it's running off a DC power. But if it plugs into the outlet, the outlet provides AC. And so anything like that is going to have one of these boxes where it converts the AC to DC. Sometimes the boxes are hooked in with a plug at the end. So you got one of those really big plugs, they just move the box all the way to the end. When we make circuits, there's lots of different components or pieces that can go into the circuit. Um, you've already talked about batteries and we introduced resistors. And so there are actually a lot more that you can put in as well. And as you get a bunch of them, it's going to be important to be able to keep that organized and straight. You need some sort of a map or diagram to help guide you. Wiring diagrams are really important in showing you how the wires connect. They don't necessarily show you where they physically are, but how they connect. When you're building a, a, a little circuit, you'd often call this sort of diagram of where the different pieces are and how they connect a schematic. And a schematic is a special series of pictures designed to represent physical things. The schematic for a battery, you've probably already seen a, a, an A cell or a, a triple A or a D cell is just like a tall line next to a short line. If you have like a 9 volt battery with multiple cells, you're supposed to draw either two or three of those. And you'll see a lot of uh, authors and textbooks and websites are sort of lazy. They'll pick one way of drawing them to stick with it and not be real consistent with that. But um, you, you see batteries drawn all those different ways. You know. The next thing is a resistor. And I wouldn't be hypersensitive about how many up and down or how many squiggles you have, but it just has this general look to it when you look at a resistor. The schematic for resistor looks like this. Uh, a light bulb is another schematic you'll see quite often because they're very useful in seeing if a circuit is working or not. Does the light bulb light up or not? So this is a schematic for a light bulb. If you're talking about a switch, there are two common types of switches. Um, there are many types of switches, but we're going to only talk about two in this video. One is the single pull, single throw switch. It looks like this. Single pull, single throw switch. And the other is a push button. This is the normally open push button, meaning it's normally turned off when you push it to turn it on. I'm going to show you why that is. Here I have a circuit set up with just a switch, a light bulb, and a power source. And you can see right now that this is open. There's a bunch of space here. But if I were to close it and have the power turned on, the light bulb lights up. So when I close it, the light bulb comes on. And so when I open it, it's off. And so we use this phraseology that things, when the circuit is open, no current can flow because no current can flow through these two pieces. It blocks the electrons from getting from this post to that post. They can't make it from one to the other. So it's an open circuit. Everything turns off. You close the circuit where now electrons can flow between there. And then you have a closed circuit and things turn on. Okay? I'm going to turn off here and the power coming into this. And I'm going to switch this up with a normally open push button so you can see what that does as well. So this is my normally open push button. Um, without doing anything normally, it's open, which means it's off. But hey, what would happen if I were to push it? Well, then I would close the contacts. And when I close the contacts, it comes on. So normally it's open, off. And when I push it so it's closed, it is on. Apparently it's a bad contact too. There are three ways circuits can be wired and only three ways circuits can be wired. Every circuit is wired in one of these three ways. Either it is in series 
or it is in parallel, or it is in a combination of both series and parallel. That's it. Series, parallel, or some sort of combination where we mix the two together. Now, they have different characteristics, the circuits do, based on whether they're in series or parallel. In a series circuit, there is one path for the current to flow through. In a series circuit, there is only one path for the current to flow through. In a parallel circuit, there are multiple paths for the current to flow through. In a parallel circuit, there are multiple pathways for the current to flow through. In a combination circuit, you're going to have some areas where there's only one path, in other areas where there are multiple paths, okay? And so that is how we define whether a circuit is series or parallel. I have two circuits here. This one is a series circuit. Notice there's one path. The electricity can come through this wire, go through this light bulb, through this one, through this one, and then through this one. And then it will leave through this wire. Now right now it's an open circuit because I haven't hooked up my uh, final wire here and I want these light bulbs to stay visible. I put some tape on them but they keep turning. Grr. More tape. Okay, so we have these light bulbs and they're in series because there's only one path for the current to take. Now, when I complete the, the, the circuit by closing it, by adding my negative here, notice what happens. All the light bulbs come on. Okay? But, what would happen if I would remove just this one? So I'm going to take this one light bulb and pull it out. They all go out. Why? Because if I open the circuit here, I've stopped current from throwing, flowing here, and therefore stops it everywhere. Because there's only one path. And when there's only one path on the highway, only one road, and the road gets blocked up and stopped, and nothing can pass on point, it backs up everywhere, and no one can get around. There's this huge traffic jam, and so the electrons are piling up here. But until they can move, everything's off. Now once I complete the circuit by adding the ball back, the electrons can move again, and we have uh, the ball turn on. Let's compare that to a parallel situation. I have a parallel circuit here. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect this. In parallel, you'll notice that there are multiple paths. And so I can make this top branch positive. And notice the electrons could come through this, go down here, and come back, or they could come across here and go down and come back. So it has options. It can go this path or this path, or that one, or that one, and so on. So there's multiple pathways it could take. Now, oh, don't fall, don't fall. I am coordinated, don't laugh at me. Okay, I'm gonna hook up that ground wire. And then I'm going to hook up the positive wire. I had the positive wire hooked up ahead of time for the other one. And lower the voltage a little bit. Okay. So notice all the light bulbs come on in parallel, just like they did in series. But here's one of the differences. If I were to take this light bulb out, what happens with the rest of them? They stay on because we all have our own pathway. So just because I blocked up this pathway and nothing can flow through here, doesn't stop anything from flowing over here. So the electrons can still go through that pathway, in that one, in that one, and so forth. So in parallel, you have multiple different pathways. How do you think the outlets in your house are wired? In series or in parallel? They're wired in parallel. You don't want to have to plug up something in the kitchen just so the outlet in your bedroom will work. No, you got to have them wired in parallel so they'll all work independently. Okay, so parallel and series are different that way. Series is also beneficial in some situations. We'll talk more about that later. Um, actually, we'll mention now if you have a switch that you want to put in your circuit, you have to put that in series because otherwise you could shut off that branch 
and everything else would stay on. So you have to use series when you're wiring in like a switch in parallel when you're wiring in like your outlets. So now let's talk about how resistors specifically are affected when we put them in series versus parallel. So it turns out in series the resistance of resistors simply adds. It's very convenient. You have a uh, two resistors you put together, you simply add their resistance together. This device is a digital multimeter. They really range in cost from about $10 from the cheapest one to a couple hundred for the best ones. I recommend, oh for Pete's sakes. So this is a multimeter. It can be used to measure uh, multiple things. I can set it here to read voltage, but if I go up here, there's the ohm symbol. I'm measuring resistance. I have two resistors here. I'm going to put this one into the breadboard, so just to hold it still, and uh, that'll make it easier for me to read the resistance of it. And all I have to do is take these test probes, and I'll touch each side, and you'll see on the screen it will adjust here in a moment. Hopefully. All right, so I'm getting 0.468 ohms, but that's in kilo ohms, so it's actually 468 ohms. That is 468 ohms, or 0.468 kilo ohms. So we have a 468 ohm resistor there, and I got another resistor here. This one is rated at 100 ohms. And I'm feeling it's going to read pretty close to that. So I've put this one in down below. Notice that there's no connection here because there's empty space that's open between them. And I'm going to go ahead and touch them. And it's reading 100.8 or 101 ohms. Okay, so right around 100. So what's going to happen if I put them in series? So I move this up here and we have essentially 100 ohms and 480 I think it was and so the two of them together should read around 580 ohms so let's see what happens when they're in series 570 ohms must have been 470 reading is 569 so around 570 ohms okay. oh, there's 570 how about that Okay. In parallel, the resistors act differently. They actually add to reduce the overall amount of resistance in the circuit. So in series, they add making the overall resistance bigger, but if you put resistors in parallel, the overall resistance will actually get smaller. This is because you're increasing the cross-sectional area of the overall resistor, but mathematically, it follows this formula which is real easy to put into your calculator if you just use the inverses. So we're going to go ahead and do that again with those two resistors. Let's see what happens when we put them in parallel and we'll verify the resistance in the calculator. Okay, okay so let's go back through this. I have put the resistors now so that they are in parallel. That means they're connected by a brass clip here and a brass clip here. So those two sides are connected, those two ends are connected, if I measure the equivalent resistance with a multimeter, this is a 100, that's a 470. And in parallel, it reduces the overall voltage. So we should get less than the smallest resistor. Smallest resistor is 100, we're getting 83 ohms. So less than the smallest resistor, 83 ohms. Awesome. Mathematically, why is that so? Well, remember our formula with inverses, and on the calculator, there's an easy work with it you can do using the x to the minus 1 button. So I'm going to go with 100 x to the minus 1 plus my other resistors 470 to the minus 1. And I have to put that in parentheses and take the whole thing to the minus 1. And that gives me 82.45. We measured 83. Physics works. Let's look at this situation when we are 
finding the resistance between points A and B. This is a combination where we have a series section here, a parallel section here. What's the equivalent resistance? The way we do this is we draw what we call an equivalent circuit. We ask ourselves, okay, for this section, what one resistor could replace those two? And I'm going to have to go ahead and use my uh, inverse formula to solve the resistance of these two in parallel. So I'm going to grab a calculator. The resistance in parallel is going to be 90 to the minus 1 plus 110 to the minus 1. You have to take the whole thing to the minus 1. and you get 49.5 ohms. And so if I were to sketch an equivalent circuit, I would have still the 50 ohms here. I would still have 80 ohms next to it. But equivalent to both of those would be this new one that was 49.5. Then I could treat this just like a series circuit, and in series we would just add. So the resistance in series would be 50 plus 80 plus 49.5. That's going to be 179, 170.5 ohms. You probably would just round that to 180. Um, but that's how you would go ahead and get the equivalent resistance for a combination circuit. A trick you can use to solve uh, parallel resistors if they are the same value, and this only works if the resistors are the same value, is simply divide by the number of resistors. So two 40 ohm resistors in parallel, well there's two of them, and 40 divided by 2 is 20. So the equivalent resistance of this situation would be 20 ohm. If I added two more resistors, one here, also called 40, And we'll have another one here, also called 40. Now I have four 40 ohm resistors in parallel. Well, 40 divided by 4 is 10, and so the equivalent resistance of this would be 10 ohms. This only works if they're in parallel, if they are all the same value of resistance. You can just take the value of that resistance, that they all are, and divide by the numbers of resistors, and it will give you the equivalent resistance. That's a quick trick to help you out. No, you try. Take a look at those three circuits on the board and find the equivalent resistance. Hit pause, that way you don't see the answers. Hit pause and go ahead and find the equivalent resistance for all three of those circuits. Let's go ahead and go over these. Number one, the 40 and the 90, they're in series. In a series you just add, 40 plus 90 is 130. In blue, Number two, they're in parallel, and for those you have to add inversely using the negative one power, and you get 545 ohms. In green, I use my green pointer, number three, they're all 500 ohms. So I use my trick with two 500 ohm resistors that are in parallel, I can divide 500 by two, and that gives me 250 as the equivalent resistance for those two. So that's a series to the 500, so I have to add 500 to it, giving me a total of 750 ohms. Thanks for watching.